Tonight on Chronicle, from a block of wood to a sound that wrenches the soul, how the masters at the UNH Violin Institute craft instruments for the ages. What brings people to New Hampshire is the staff have the finest training there is. They come for that standard. And when you hear the name of one of the finest violin makers in the world, you probably think of Europe. Well, tonight we travel to one of the world's most revered violin institutes, a place where people from around the globe gather to learn about the craft from the masters. And wouldn't you know it, for 35 years it's been right here in the Granite State. What makes a person say, I want to play the violin? You know, what motivates it? What is the, uh, the, uh, the very beginning? It's starting to become flexible. Therefore, we have to be very careful. Carl Roy helps people learn to craft string instruments. For many years, he was the director of such schools in Germany, where there are strict guidelines for becoming a master. In my hometown in Mittenwald, Bavaria, Germany, there uh, are instruments built since around 1680. And uh, of course, you must be a good craftsman, but also you must uh, uh, be able to recognize beauty. Years ago, someone from UNH traveled to his school in Germany to see if one of his apprentices might come to Durham to share their knowledge. Since Carl spoke English and thought it might make for a nice summer vacation, he made the trip and has for the last 35 years. I found that uh, the American violin makers have really quite a bit improved within the last 20 years. In 25 or 30 years, there was not much going on that had been primarily Europeans uh, working here. They immigrated, you know. Roy has written a highly respected text on becoming a master. He says there are really no training options in the United States, and that has made the Violin Craftsmanship Institute at UNH very popular. This is my third year, and um, this is absolutely um, a wonderful course. Actually, we have been um, looking for all this throughout uh, the whole of the United States or anywhere, anywhere parts of the world, but I would say that um, my partner, my business partner in uh, Singapore, he said that try to try UNH and then um, have the lessons with uh, the masters here, then uh, you will find it fantastic, well trained, and then you have all the skills that uh, you needed to um, operate your sort of a business and set up. That's what I'm here. There's a class in building and repairing the bow, too. Lynn Hannings, who studied in Paris, calls the bow the soul of the sound of the instrument. We have body parts. We've got a head, we've got a cheek, <laughs> we've got a neck. <laughs> and then we go down the length of the stick to the other end. There's a winding down here that uh, protects the stick from sweat from the player's hand. Something cushiony here so that musicians don't get injuries to their thumb, thumb tips. And then this is called the frog, and that's just the part that is the, the handle. These instructors are considered among the best in the world, have worked with the finest orchestras, cared for incredible collections. Everything needs to be considered, the weight, the balance, the strength of the stick, that all needs to be considered for the individual player for the instrument that they're using, for their body size, uh, for the kind of music that they're playing. A chamber music player would have different requirements from a symphonic player. So it's really, it's very interesting. The wood used to make the bow is now an endangered species. 
It's called Pernambuco. It comes from one small portion, one small area on the northeastern corner of Brazil. And uh, I'm the president of an organization that's working to reforest that. But we also have educational work that needs to be done around the world. And one of those jobs is what these students are doing to try to preserve those old bones. There are several courses offered over several weeks. Horst Kloss holds a workshop on learning how to repair the violin. Students from all over bring along instruments that need help. And this touch-up is like, uh, in a way, you doing pixels, you're doing dots uh, many times. Some students are teachers, some have workshops, but all are welcome to learn from master craftsmen with European apprenticeships and training who have worked for the world's finest shops. During my time, I've been doing this since 14 years old, and, uh, and there is a progression. The violin makers, uh, as I knew them, had a tremendous talent and could make a really good instrument. And then the next generation, they had an education. So they had some knowledge about chemistry, so, uh, something about physics. The instruments they made, talent and knowledge, they became better. There is a certain romance that goes with having a violin, even if you don't play. These experts are constantly asked to assess an instrument that has been handed down or discovered in the attic. Oh yes, every day there'll be calls. You need to be somewhat respectful and spend some time with it and say, you know, where was it made? Where did it fit in? Many times the cost of repair is greater than any price attached to it, but value is often sentimental. Then, of course, we go over it and sometimes it needs work and sometimes it needs more work than it, it, it's worth. Mm -hmm. But if it's a sentimental piece, uh, then money sometimes doesn't matter. The magic of the violin, its art, its music, its place in tradition and culture are being preserved and New Hampshire is playing a role. What brings people to New Hampshire is the staff, Carl Roy and the making, who is the founder of this program, Lynn Hennings, uh, working with Bose, myself, have the finest training there is. They come for that standard and so that's what's important. <laughs>